So how do you entomb it into hard rock permafrost? Here's the Barris of Aqua Mammoth. That's the way it was found, even though it, it slid or slumped down into the river. That's probably the general position it died, and the slump just didn't, it did not disturb it as it came down. It just came down in a massive flow and onto the uh, coast of the Barisabaka River in northeast Siberia. It's in a general standing position. This is another animal they find in a general standing position. This is how they find it down here. It was found in a gold mine, and they used to put uh, lanterns on its paws to light the, the mine tunnel. That's what they, that's what you observe. So they dug it out and found out it was headless, first of all, and it's in a general standing position. So here's how uh, uh, Dale Guthrie at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, who I think is the closest uniformitarian scientist to understanding what's going on there, this is how he think it, it died. It, it slipped in a bog and, and sunk in a bog in a general standing position. And a lion came by and ate off its head, and then a mass flow came and covered up until it was 26 feet deep, and then the, the miners came and found the lower portion of it. There's one problem with this scenario. You look at the, uh, the material around it, the sediments around it, and it's not bog sediments. It's something else. So he's got the right idea, I think, but I think it's the wrong, he's got some things wrong with it. It's not a bog but it's in a general standing position. Tomachov also said, speaking of the, uh, the general uh, standing position, he says, Brandt, who was an early Siberian explorer, was very much impressed by the fact that remnants of the mammoth, carcasses and skeletons alike, just not the carcasses, sometimes, remember sometimes, this is not the normal, this is rather the rare cases, I might add, Sometimes were found in poses which indicated that the animals had perished standing upright as though they had been bogged. See, they, that's what you'd normally think of. They got caught in a bog, even though there's not bog sediments around them. There's some other type of sediments. Henry Holworth in The Mammoth and the Flood in 1887. By the way, this flood was not the Genesis flood. He tried to explain the extinction of the woolly mammoths by being buried in a flood, a low flood that swept all across Siberia. He said, now by no physical process known to us can we understand how soft flesh could thus be buried in ground while it's still frozen as hard as flint without disintegrating it. We cannot push an elephant's body into a mass of solid ice or hard frozen gravel and clay without entirely destroying the fine articulations and pounding the whole mass into a jelly. Nor would we fail in greatly disturbing the ground in the process. How do we get it into the permafrost? So these are... These carcasses present some major mysteries that have not been solved today. Now, there's three categories of mammoth extinction theories. There's the uniformitarian ideas, which says that, well, the climate wasn't much different. But, you know, I think they're out of touch with reality. The more we know about those animals up there, the more the climate has to be greatly different. I already don't think they've faced the situation. Then there's the non-creationist catastrophists, as I call them. Henry Holworth, I mentioned him. Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote uh, two, some very provocative books in the 1950s on astrocatastrophe and, and astrocatastrophism, where Venus and Mars were moving through the solar system. And the mammoth was one of the major reasons he wrote those books. Earth and Upheaval is another one of them. The mammoth is one of the major reasons he wrote those, those books. And then Ivan Sanderson and Charles Hapgood. Now, Velikovsky believes that these, when Mars or Venus got close to the Earth, it perturbed the orb tilt, and it went like this. The Earth went like that. So the woolly mammoths were pleasantly grazing in the subtropics and suddenly were brought up to uh, the North Pole and frozen instantly. That's his idea. It's, uh, it's a, uh, catastrophic, but it's uh, what I call the non-creation uh, catastrophe. Now, Ivan Sanderson and Hapgood believe instead of the poles shifting, the crust of the earth shifted up there and then back. These are pretty wild ideas. <laughs> and these were non-creationists, by the way. And then, of course, creationists would be wondering about them. And, of course, we were split into generally two camps. Actually, there's a third camp that I just found out about. Number one, a quick freeze early in the flood. That's what, how a lot of creationists have tried to explain it over the years. And another group of creationists has said uh, it's at the end of the post-flood rapid ice age. Now, when I examined this 
in the 1980s, I thought the evidence was very strong in favor of death at the end of an ice age, and I'll tell you why pretty soon. Those are Velikovsky's two major books. Now, many people have never heard of Velikovsky. I've uh, taken polls in audiences, and very few people even remember him, but he, he was a very interesting character. But he was prone to exaggeration. In speaking of the deposits in Alaska, where you find the mammoths, he described it like this. Under what conditions did this great slaughter take place in which millions upon millions of animals were torn limb from limb and mingled with uprooted trees? He's speaking of what's called muck in Alaska. That's what the gold miners call it when they wash it away to get at the gravel below. It's called muck. And that's where you find the vast majority of vegetation and animals, and they are sort of mingled uh, chaotically. But there's a reason for that. Muck is mainly the material that they're buried in, but it's been slumped down and mixed by mass movement. That's it's re uh, really not a, a mystery. Now, there's pretty strong evidence that they didn't die in the flood. First of all, why focus just on Siberia? They're part of a mammoth steppe community. A steppe is a, is a dry grassland community that stretches from the Atlantic clear through Asia to the Pacific down into North America. Why just focus on Siberia? They're just part of this whole steppe community, so you'd expect that, that whatever that, and by the way, in this other, these other areas, they're obviously post-flood. So you've got to connect the Siberian ones with the others, I would say, because they're all part of a post-flood mammoth steppe community. Also, you find woolly mammoths on cave walls in, in Europe, and then as clear close to Siberia as the Ural Mountains. And that is so close to Siberia. By the way, cave paintings are not a flood phenomenon. They're a post-flood phenomenon. Also, and this is one of the most significant ones, bones are found on top of glacial till. Till is the uh, debris from the Ice Age where you have rocks of all sizes mixed with a finer grain matrix. The bones of woolly mammoths are found on top of glacial till in northwest Siberia. Northwest Siberia was glaciated, and the mammoths like to live, it's apparently, close to the ice. And when the ice receded, they just walked right up there and they died right on top of the glacial till. Well, that's not, that's a flood death. I mean, that's a, a ice age death, not a flood death. And they're also found in surficial sediments. Now, if they died early in the flood, they would be at the bottom of the sedimentary rocks in Siberia. And they're not. You don't find them there. You find them always in the surficial sediments at the top. So it's pretty strong that they did not die in the flood. And there's strong evidence against the quick freeze itself, I might add, which is their mechanism that they use to, to, for them to go extinct during the flood. What are some of those evidences against the quick freeze? First of all, when we talk about mammoth carcasses, we're only talking about a very few. There's only, a, I'd say, as far as mammoths and other carcasses, there's probably a dozen whole carcasses we're talking about of the millions of bones that, and tusks that they find up there. And by the way, they define carcasses as any scrap of flesh. So if you define it that way, we got probably less than a hundred carcasses. And whole carcasses, about a dozen. So we're talking about a very small number compared to, the, to all the mammoths that were up there. So why have a theory just for them? You've got to have a theory for the majority of them and try to figure out the, the, the rare exceptions after the, the general theory. Also, you hear stories that, uh, that um, men ate mammoth steaks and things like this. Now, I couldn't verify that, but I know, they know that dogs have eaten mammoth. Uh, but, uh, and the reason they say that is because, well, because this meat was so fresh that you could do that. Well, actually, according to the experts, the, the, a lot of it, or practically all of it, is partially decayed. Some of it looks fresh, but as soon as it's unfrozen, it's, just, it's brown, it stinks right away, so it's already partially decayed. And by the way, a quick freeze would freeze it instantly, and it would be fresh, and you could eat mammoth steaks. And also you find fly pupae by the thousands, not only in the bones, also in the carcasses. Not while they're exposed, but after you dig them up, you find these pupae, indicating that they sat around for a while under normal death and burial, and flies came in there. Now, a quick freeze would freeze it solidly, and it would have to thaw out for that to happen, but in the scenario with the, the flood, they get quickly frozen and buried right away, which has no time for fly pupae to, or flies to get on these carcasses. Also, when you examine 
the vegetation in the stomach, you can deduce, now this is uh, more speculative, but you can deduce by the, the type of vegetation, the state of the flowering, that there's different seasons of death. If it was a quick freeze during the flood, it would happen at the same instant. So because of the different seasons, and by the way, a lot of times it's late summer or early fall is what a lot of them are, but there is indication that, that some of them died in the winter time. In a quick freeze, it would be in an instant, in one season, whatever that would be, was. Also in Siberia, for some reason, most of the remains are mammoths. And we know that there's a lot of other animals up there. In fact, all through the northern hemisphere, we find these other animals that live with them. But in Siberia, it seems like the other animals had time to escape. A quick freeze would freeze all the animals up there in their tracks. And I believe we'd find a lot more animals besides a majority of our woolly mammoths. I think we'd find a lot more besides just a majority of woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoths would be a minority. Also, stomach contents are found in partially preserved USA mastodons in the northeast U.S. There, now, you find a lot of mastodons, which is kind of like a cousin to a woolly mammoth, and you, they're found in bogs in the northeast, and the number of occasions they have found stomach remains you can identify in these mastodons, and, and no one would say that they were quick frozen. Why they are preserved like that is not quite sure, but it at least says that it can ha if it happened other places, it likely wasn't a quick freeze in Siberia. So there's some pretty strong arguments against a quick freeze. So the other, only solution left is that they died at the end of the Ice Age. I think that answers most of the questions. So you, that brings up the question, if it wasn't a quick freeze, how do we account for the half-decayed vegetation in the stomach? Good question. Well, I'm not quite sure, but I think it could be because of the digestive system of an elephant. It's different than a cow in that most of the digestion takes place after the stomach, the stomach is mainly a holding pouch for vegetation. It's acidic, and the acid will break down some of the vegetation, but it doesn't have microorganisms that do the digestion in, a, in an elephant. For instance, Gary Haynes says in Mammoth, Macedons, and Elephants, the digestive system is based on post-gastric hindgut fermentation. That is digestion after the stomach into the intestines. The stomach is, a lar is large, but serves mainly to store ingested food. In other words, it's just a storage pouch waiting for ingest, uh, digestion. Enzymes within the stomach partly break down the vegetation, but most nutrients are extracted in the huge cecum and large intestine, where microbes ferment the food remaining after gastric processing. So I think it's possible that it's because the digestion doesn't take place in the stomach that if you froze it fairly quick, not instantaneously. By the way, those that believe in an instant quick freeze believe that suddenly the temperature dropped to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't translate that at the moment to centigrade, but that's very cold. Suddenly, that's what they believe to, to account for that state of vegetation in their stomach. But we might not need to account for that. We can say maybe it was a gradual freeze because the, the, the stomach contents remained in a half decayed state and stayed that way until it was, it was frozen slowly. So that's a possibility I'm throwing out. I need to find more information about that. Therefore, if uh, the Uniformitarians can't explain it and the non-creationist catastrophists have a lot of serious problems, well, what about us? Can we explain it at the end of the Ice Age? Can a post-flood Ice Age model account for these mammoth mysteries? I think it accounts for most of them. I believe the Genesis Flood fulfills the requirements for an Ice Age, first of all. So at the end of the, of the Flood, you'd have all this volcanic ash and aerosols trapped in the stratosphere. And that reflects sunlight back to space. So that would cause cooling over the large continental areas at mid and high latitudes, mainly in summertime. So that would be the mechanism for the cooler summers you need for an Ice Age. What about all the, the snow you need for an Ice Age? Well, the fountains of the Great Deep whatever that was, probably springs or water trapped under the crust that would be warm, spilled out during the flood, you'd end up with warm water, pole to pole and top to bottom, at the end of the flood. The significance of this is that the warmer the water, the more the evaporation. And it'd be at mid and high latitude, so you'd evaporate a lot more water into the atmosphere for the ice age to occur. This mechanism would persist, but it would wane with time as the volcanism, post-flood volcanism, would slow down and the ocean cools off. I did some calculations on this, and the post-flood ice age 
is a, uh, takes about approximately 500 years based on the cooling time of the oceans. Deglaciation is very rapid based on the uh, energy balance over a snow cover. It's about 100 to 200 years. So the total time for an ice age is approximately 700 years. 